So uh, this one is, uh, this, this session is on energy saving opportunities in compressed air systems. Uh, so we're gonna go through, gonna go through a lot of different areas uh, with compressed air. Okay, so first of all, Compressed Air Challenge. Uh, compressed Air Challenge is actually a voluntary collaborative of all of these folks that you see on here. So it includes KGI, it includes distributors, facility, consultants, energy folks, utilities, Department of Energy, and really they had one thing in mind, was to go through and help end users improve their, their plant performance and perform the performance of their compressed air systems. And we'll show you about the efficiency of compressed air systems and why you want to go through and think about that. So why do we care to begin with? So this is just uh, some facts from the Department of Energy. So in the United States, compressed air accounts for more than $5 billion um, a year in energy cost. It represents 10% of the, all the electricity used in North America. And it accounts for about 16% of all the motor systems that's out there. Okay. Now, now, granted, when you start talking about office buildings, I also understand that a lot of it, there, there may not be a lot of compressed air usage because a lot of it's just going to be in if systems that are old pneumatic systems and, and you don't need a ton of compressed air for that. And so you're like, well, why should we know about this? Why should we bother? Well, I'll give you a, a personal example. As I mentioned, I started out as a stationary engineer in a hospital. And so we had, we had 25, 50, 75 horsepower motors. I mean compressors, and we had a, a 150 vac vacuum system, and so I was working full time, going to school full time, getting my degree, got my degree, and ended up um, being hired at Ford Motor Company to be their powerhouse chief at the Chicago stamping plant. So I go down for the interview, and the guy says, do you know compressors? And of course I puff out my chest and I say, of course I know compressors, and I rattle off what it is, and he looks at me and laughs, he says, those are tire pumps, we use those to start ours. So we walked past the 125 horsepower compressor and the small compressors were 800 horse synchronous motors, 4200 CFM, and around the corner were the 10,000 CFM centrifugals, two of them, 2500 horsepower, 13,000 volt drives, direct drives on it. And I said, we're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. So again, we're now in the big stuff. So your, your whole career can change and it can, you can go from being in the little stuff and the normal stuff to in the big stuff real quick, but the principles are still the same. The principles you use and the systems approach is still going to be the same no matter what the system. The only difference is what? What you can afford to actually put in and change because what are the savings? Big systems versus small systems. Okay? So again, there's a, there's a factor that we need to go through and understand that. And the most important thing is compressed air is not free. Through this, if you take nothing else out, you'll find out that compressed air is very inefficient as, a, as an actual media and transfer and the way to go through and do it. And we want to go through and make sure that you understand some of those principles and how we can go through and get it. So to give you an example, again, 100 PSI compressed air can range from anywhere from 18 to 32 cents per 100 cubic feet, depending on if it's an air-cooled system or a water-cooled system. The automo automobile industry can go anywhere from 10% to up to 40% in, um, in stamping plants of their, of their actual, actual usage. Uh, air leaks can account for 20 to 30%, as high as 50% of all of, the, all of the usage. And in four Ford plants that I was at, the, uh, they can be anywhere from several hundred thousand dollars to millions of dollars actually in a plant itself, okay? Now again, it's not going to be that way for, for, for um, commercial buildings, but I also want you to start thinking about, not only when you talk commercial, start thinking about campus areas. Say, what do they do in a campus area? What do you do with anything that has a central system that may have compressed air that's going through and shipping it all over? You're going to have the same distribution problems, you're going to have the same leaks, you're going to have the same thing that happens there, and I will tell you that most of the times it's not looked at, it's not even managed, okay? So when you start getting into hospitals, they can get into using it for breathing air, they can use it for not just controls, there's a lot of pneumatic work that they can go through and do inside the operating room, so there's a lot of stuff that, can, that the pneumatics can be used for uh, as we look at that. And when you get into R&D facilities, campuses, etc., it could be anything when you, when you go through and get into it, okay? So, not very efficient. And it's really not very efficient because we've got energy savings here. We just knocked out the entire thing. So, there we go. 
I pushed the wrong button. That will teach me. Okay. So this just represents uh, an input work that we have. If you look at for every seven and a half horsepower you put in on the, on the left hand side, the right hand side, you get one horsepower worth of useful work. Okay. The, the way this walks down is a seven and a half goes to about six and a half uh, for the losses that are through the motors and the, and the drive and everything that goes into the compressor itself. Once you get into compressor, you've got a lot of losses in heat of compression. As a matter of fact, they're terrible at making air, but boy, are they good at heating. And the problem is you've got to get rid of that heat. And you guys will also find that if you're going through and doing some of the retro commissioning work, that if you've got compressors in a mechanical equipment room, they may not be getting enough heat out of there, and that's going to be causing some issues in that area as well for other pieces of equipment that you have in the system itself. So it's an important part to understand where the losses are. So we're going to reduce the cost of compressed air. The main thing is to go through and take, care, take a look at the system efficiency and take a, a systems approach, and that's really all about the, what the compressed air challenge training has been about. The principles you want to be aware of is you want to know about awareness on it. You want to establish the baselines, which you, are, you guys are very familiar with. You want to calculate costs and relate it back to, I put production here, but I'll say it doesn't matter. Whatever the, whatever the operation facility measures their, their actual goals in, put it back to that. Because now it puts it on every single operational cost that they look at. Whether it's a cost per unit, whether it's a square foot, whether it's an occupancy rate, doesn't matter what they're using, if they have some kind of a cost that they're trying to reduce, it puts it back in terms that puts it on every other single piece of, piece of, um, you know, of, of objective that they have. Important to align supply with demand. Uh, reduce system pressure, we'll talk about that. Air quality requirements, high pressure applications, high volume, all affect the pressure pieces of it. Inappropriate uses, we'll talk some about that as well. Air leaks, which is a big one, heat recovery, um, total system design, and then integrating it into current processes. So first, we're going to go through and talk about establishing a baseline. The key measurables uh, are going to be flow electric, uh, again, for the baseline operations. But again, we want to get that so we can go through and determine the cost on it so we can evaluate the improvements. The efficiency is always determined by flow and the, the power consumption in KW. So how efficient is the system for what I'm making, both from a compressed, compressor standpoint, but also all the ancillary equipment and all the uses that are in a plant and facility um, that you have. Converting that compressed air usage into dollars, again, puts it into, into um, terms everyone understands. And again, putting it to their measurables is very powerful. And as I'm going along, if anybody has questions, comments, please don't hesitate to stop me, okay? So, first thing we're going to go through and do is we're going to look at a, at a pressure profile. When you look at a pressure profile, you really want to know how dynamic the system is and what the uses are in there. So again, it gives you, you want to go through and look at it before and after main components at the beginning and end of the distribution system and several critical points of use. Um, I always ask people, what, how do you consider a critical point of use? Pardon? I said you can't do without it. Can't do without it, absolutely. The other one is the screen method. As soon as the compressors go down, who screams, right? Who is the ones that first goes through and says they're having problems with their processes, their equipment, no matter what it is, or in, in this case, you know, even the controls and building comfort that you go through and have. This again should be done over time, several different periods and conditions, um, and that pressure vari variation needs to be taken into consideration because again, what are we trying to do? We're trying to align with supply with demand and the type of compressors, the way they control and how they control is critical to going through and understanding which ones you use as a base load, which one you go through and use as a, as a trim machine. So again, the demands always drive the requirements. The operation, the number duration, pressure flow are driven by the end use and the dynamics of it. And the relationship requires understanding of the monitoring, controlling, not only the compressors, but the end uses. So understanding what they're being used for and how. 
So again, this is the, it, we talk about this in every single session, but if you can't measure it, you really can't manage it. So really it's about establishing a baseline, understanding what it is, putting it into dollars for improvements, going through and looking at the system control and how we can control and monitor the compressors, and then using storage to help control uh, air receivers, secondary storage for some of the peak events that you have um, in there is an important part, especially depending on the type of air compressors you have. Uh, receivers are important, for example, in a load-on-load -load control rotary screw. Types of compressor controls depend on the, on, on the dynamics and the way you want to go through and run them. Controls are used to base load. Again, the best base load unit should be run at full capacity. Um, it sounds like it's, this is kind of a no-brainer, but you find a lot of times when you go into any kind of facilities that, uh, you know, that whether it's a building or whether it's a plant, what I've found over the years is they're really engineered to begin with and then they just grow and they change so much over time. Nobody keeps over, up with it. People are always tweaking, doing different things. And whether it's an operator for a building or whether it's, an op uh, whether it's a maintenance guy keeping production running, they will go through and make sure that people aren't upset, aren't screaming, and they need to go through and do what they need to do. So energy is important, but like I've told people, you know, I do, I'll do my best for the energy, but nobody ever got fired for using too much energy. Taking down an assembly or stamping plant and stopping production, that's a different story. So when you start talking about what the objectives are, you have to remember that, you, that the energy efficiency is very important, but again, you also have to understand uh, that you don't want to jeopardize production and, or any of operations, including building, building comfort. So again, we're going to go through and look, talk about the trim varying loads that you're going to want to go through and run. So for multiple compressors, you're going to want to look at sequencers, especially any large compressors. You want to go through and be able to do sequencing and turning the compressors on and off on demand. And then more sophisticated controllers, you can tie them into your building automation system and go through and have them work with your building automation system to understand what's going on. And again, going through, going through based on the size and the type of compressor and mix, it's important to understand what you can go through do and what you can also afford to go through and put in. Again, controls have to operate the right compressors under the right conditions. Um, we have a whole bunch of different types of compressors. You've got, you know, you've got the rotary screws, you've got reciprocating, you've got variable speed, you've got, um, you've got load unload with the rotary screws, you've got modulation with the rotary screws, uh, you've got double acting, single acting recips, and really the, with the controls, what is the most efficient type of compressor you can use? Anybody, what's the most type, efficient compressor out? Compressor. The one that's off, absolutely. So the whole purpose of controls and controlling and going through and sequencing is to go through and shut off compressors and keep them off for as long as you possibly can to go through and go through and get the most out of the efficiency. And when you are running part load, it's important to understand that when you go through and are loaded, running at that condition, what's the, best, what's the best mix of compressors and types that you have and how do you want to go through and maintain it? DOE went and did a did an actual study of compressed air systems in the, in the U.S. and they came back and if I had a if I had a thousand CFM peak load in, in a facility or a plant and I had an air compressor that was sized just for that thousand CFM, what percentage of the time would I actually be running at that thousand CFM? Take some guesses. Three. Three. What? Five. Five. Two. You, do okay. You guys, you guys are on the right track. It's a little bit, a little bit higher than that. It's about 15% on an average overall. But the point is, that's when you're going to spend most of your time. And what do we usually do when we size equipment? Well, we got to make sure we serve it and serve that demand. So it's got to be sized for that. And typically, it's just like any other system that you see out there, whether it's pumps, boilers, uh, chillers, HVAC. It, doesn't matter, it seems like everybody that's going in, whatever engineer makes sure that there's a safety factor on it, and depending on how many times it gets reviewed, that's how big it gets, and you have to be concerned with that. So again, understanding what the actual needs are and what the, what the intent is. So again, the controls are important. Using storage as a demand, I mentioned that briefly uh, for load on load. Primary storage is right near the compressor, secondary storage 
If you have anything that uses intermittent demands, high demands for a short period of time, you can actually put in localized storage to go through and take care of that demand event that happens. And pressure flow controllers are an optional device that can go through and help, you know, help tighten up the band and keep it really tight for systems that actually fluctuate a lot on the demand because it can respond quicker than some of the air compressor controls can respond. So typical, this is for, again, for industry, this is a typical demand components. You have leaks, which is, ends up being about a third. You got normal production, which is about a half. You have inappropriate uses, which we'll talk about. And then increasing demand due to, due to uh, excessive pressure, pressure. This is called artificial demand. What do you guys think this might be? Cooling. Cooling, okay. What else? What happens when you leak? What happens to your pressure? It goes down. So what do you have to do? Raise it up. And the more I raise it up, what does it do? It leaks more. <laughs> so, so it just keeps going through. So it's a demand that's caused mainly by leaks or by, by, how, by high pressure requirements in the system that basically require me to keep my pressure much higher. Because one of the things that we'll talk about in a rule of thumb is for every two PSI you can lower your pressure, it's 1% efficiency because I have to use less energy to get it to that level, okay? So when I'm going through and doing this, if I can lower my, lower my pressure by getting rid of the artificial demand and getting rid of the leaks, it'll go through and help me. But, so again, that, that, that gives me the efficiency not only of the leaks, but also of this artificial demand component. But I will tell you the, the caveat on that is it has to be for system supplied leaks. If you have a regulator downstream of the regulator, this isn't affected by it because it's already regulated down. Okay, unless the regulator is cranked wide open, which also happens. So key demand side points that we want to talk about. If you want to reduce unproductive demands, you want to get rid of inappropriate uses, you want to get rid of leaks, you want to go through and get, get rid of that artificial demand as much as possible, and you want to go through and reduce pressure. And there's three things up there about air quality, pressure um, applications, and high volume that go through and talk about what, what you want to go through and do. Because again, I just mentioned that 2% two, two equals 1% efficiency. If I can go through and reduce those pressure drops and I can go through and lower my pressure, I get energy efficiency. I get energy savings, okay? So to give you an example, on a, on a, at 10 cents a kilowatt hour for a compressor running around the clock, 100 horsepower compressor, going, running at 80 PSI versus 100 PSI, will save over $6,500 a year just in reducing that, that amount, okay? Because again, that's the, that's the cost that it's gonna be to operate that at a higher pressure. So some of the system, system requirements that you have to address to go through and do this, air quality requirements. Um, you, have to have the, you have to have the quality that's necessary for whatever the, whatever the need or whatever the process is, whether that's instrument air, whether that's general purpose air, uh, there's a whole ISO, there's a whole ISO um, procedure that talks about air quality. Really the key is many times people don't know what quality they need. They spec something because they think it needs to be the best it can be. And the problem is every time you go through and you get better quality, what do you need to do? You need either filter level or you have to go to different dryers. So for example, if I go from standard refrigeration dryers, which run about 35 degree dew point, the next step to go to is a desiccant dryer, which is minus 40. The problem is, depending on the type of desiccant dryers, the, the desiccant for, for a non-heated desiccant wastes 15% of its rated amount because it uses compre clean compressed air to go through and regenerate the beds. So it's an, it's an expensive way to go through and do it, but if you need dry air, you have to do that, okay? By the same token, if you say, I, don't, I can't get any, any, any mist, I can't get any oil, I gotta have microns down to a certain level, every time you do that, I have to put in a filter which does what? Drop, drop in pressure again. So I've gotta go through and treat that. So which means I have to do what? Crank the pressure up on my demand again. So again, I might supply again because my demand will see, that won't see the pressure that it needs to actually operate, okay? <laughs> So, um, we just talked about the, the check sheet and what you need to go through and look at. Um, air quality, again, adding filters just adds, I mentioned this already, 
It's a higher increased capital cost. It's more operational cost. Uh, it's additional maintenance. And many times what I found is that people just don't do the maintenance on it. It's like anything else. It's a necessary evil. And that's why we also try to show people how looking at maintenance um, rather than a necessary evil as a, if you don't do this, it's going to cost you more. So again, using this, using that 2% equals uh, of um, one PSI is, is a way to go through and do that. So also going through and looking at lower pressure drop, longer life filters will help. And, and, the, and replacing the elements again when the cost, uh, not only when it, the pressure drop exceeds it, but also when the cost of the element can exceed what the, what the, what the replacement of the element is. High pressure applications. Many times there's, a, there's, a, there's high pressure applications that are required in, a, you know, in, in buildings um, and they're a very small part of the load, but what do I have to do to a centrally supplied system? I have two systems or two exactly two systems or I got to I got to go through and feed it at high pressure. I have no choice. I've got to go through and do that. What do you consider high pressure? Good question. What would you consider high pressure? Well, we, if it was the plants in Europe, they have an eight bar and they have a twelve bar, which is basically basically ninety to one hundred psi to one hundred and thirty to one hundred and forty psi. But when we talk about high pressure, it's really a relative pressure. What is the highest pressure you use in the system that's causing you to keep the pressure at that elevated state? So it could be, you, you can have, I had, I had one uh, division that high pressure for them was 80 or 85 pounds because they were trying to get it 60 pounds. So they were specking the, the transmission and engine were specking, I want all equipment to come in 60 to 65 pounds max because I want to lower all my pressures. Okay, vehicle ops, we couldn't do that because of pneumatic guns and some of the other things we were doing, but to them, that was a high pressure, okay? That isn't a high pressure in the world of compressed air, so it's a very good question. This is a relative term when we talk about it because we want to go through and lower that entire system pressure. So what's causing me not to do that? And the example I've got up here is one that you guys will be familiar with because I was doing an energy audit of our NAO office building, North American Operations. It was a 14-story uh, office building that we had in Dearborn. And so I was doing the energy audit with it, and we were going through and doing normal look for lights, look for HVAC, look for loads, look for everything we had. You know, So what did we have in that building that we could go through and reduce? So I get downstairs, and I get into the main, main area that they have in, in the... Uh, you know, in, in the uh, parking area where they had, and I look at their air compressor, and they had a about a 30 or 40 horse air compressor. Uh, well, I guess it might have even been a little bigger, but let's say 40, 40 horsepower air compressor, and it was it was at 110 psi. <laughs> I'm going, wait a minute, guys. I'm in an office building. Why in the world do I need 110 psi? <laughs> And the people there didn't know. So I finally asked the guys in the garage, I said, in the parking area, garage area, I said, why do you guys have, do you guys know why this is up there? They said, oh yeah, because when the executives come in and their tires are low, we have to pump it up. So we go through and we maintain it. So they're maintaining 110 PSI all the time for what? Maybe 30 pounds max to go through and use for the rest of the pneumatic controls on the head? Because those are only, those are only 10, 15, 20 pounds. I mean, and even with pressure drop, it's only going to be 30 pounds max. So I basically said, okay, told them to go out to Sears, buy a small unit, and go through, and we lowered the pressure on the entire system and bought a small one and saved money. Now, it wasn't a huge amount, but it was still money that was there that you could go through and do. Okay, so again, going through and lowering that was a, was, was a significant savings, at least for that, that element. So I bring that up because you'll find these in the most unusual places. The high use uh, end pressures need to be addressed. As, was, as you mentioned over there, you can do two systems. You can go through and feed it that way. You can go through and use air boosters, intensifiers, smaller compressors, or separate compressors. Again, the whole thing about this is don't let that, do like I did, don't let that one thing drive the entire load that you're doing, because again, you're having to go through and keep it at a much higher level, which basically, you know, that pressure is compression ratio, and it is nothing but horsepower, okay? Nothing but horsepower, okay? So again, test any assumptions regarding the pressure. You'll also find that many times people don't really, really understand what it, what it takes to go through and do it. 
one of the divisions I had, the, the, uh, the actual requirement was do not, you know, that we had to have a minimum of 110. And then when I went back and looked at their own specs for the pneumatic tools, it was a maximum of 110. And when you really look at it, it has to do with the size of the line and the actual flow. So understanding what that is is important on what they do. So you got to go through and, and test those assumptions. And if, you, if it actually requires the high pressure and it's a small percentage, make sure it doesn't drive your system. Find some way to feed it some other way. Either modify the equipment or find something else that can go through and actually feed that system. And again, take advantage of lowering that pressure. You might not get into many of these, but high volume intermittent applications uh, really are something that takes a large amount of air for a short period of time. One of the ones in industry that's the most common is what's called a bag house, which basically it's for dusty environments, it filters the air, it's an HVAC tool that filters the air, and you got big vacuum cleaner bags and the HVAC system takes the air through it, it collects all the dust, and then you use compressed air to open up the air, pop open the vacuum bags, drop it into a drop it into a little dumpster and you roll it away. Okay? The problem you have is that that puff of air take, is for a short duration of time, but takes a lot of air in that short duration. And because it's in like a tenth of a second, it can be, you know, a, 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 a one that says th an average load of 36 CFM at a tenth of a second can actually be over a thousand CFM per minute when you calculate it out, okay? What that does is that drops all the pressure and usually bells and whistles and everything goes off because you start having problems with pressure in the plant. So one thing you do is you go through and use, so you use storage there, you use metered recovery, and so the time in between those pulses you use to fill up a tank, and then when that pulse hits, it's fed from the tank rather than the entire system. So that's the premise of this. I'm not sure you'll get into a lot of that with retro commissioning, but if you get into areas where they're doing intermittent loads and doing testing and doing things like that, you may have that to, as an issue. Um, inadequate distribution uh, piping system can lead to pressure drops and other problems, as well as leaks can as well. Um, the next one I want to talk about is inappropriate uses. So this is just giving, basically this is, again, back to, back to Ford. In the beginning of Henry Ford's day, he went through and had coal boilers that generated his own electricity through through turbines and through the turbines that he condensed the steam and the way he condensed the steam is either through smaller turbines running compressors or big engine driven, big flywheel dri driven steam engine compressors. Fast forward to the, and that was efficient. At that time it was almost free because he had to condense it anyways, right? Fast forward to now we don't generate our own power, we don't go through and have coal boilers, we don't go through and, and we don't go through and um, have the need for going through and condensing so we're now direct, do, doing the electricity direct drive. Doing what? Going through and using it right from the grid. And when we do that, it now is very, very expensive to go through and do. So we want to go through and start looking. It's typical for, for companies and organizations to always do the same thing they've always done. That's the way we've been doing it. And the biggest thing I think you guys also find you're fighting with the way people operate buildings is that's the way we always did it. Why should we change, okay? Same thing with this. That's with pneumatics many times is, that's the way we've always did it, done it, and in the past, you didn't have a technology like you do now where you can use a lot of electric drives and do a direct, direct usage. So what does that look like? So just an example, at, at uh, the compressed air system we already talked about. The percentage of a compressed air system can be as low as 10 or 15% conversion rate. So um, again, very inefficient media of going through and doing it. So if I have a one horsepower motor versus a one horsepower electric running five days a week, two shift operation at 10 cents a kilowatt hour, you can see here that that, that compressed air one will cost you uh, $2,330 and the electric is just under 400 so it's a huge difference in that. So when we start talking about going through and doing changes, you want to think about things that you can go through and do differently. So what are some of the inappropriate uses that may, you may have? There's a lot of these that may or may not go through and, and uh, you know, be there, be in something that we would see in buildings. But anybody that's using open blowing 
whether it's whether it's maintenance guys that like cleaning off whatever they're working on or cleaning off parts when they're going through and rebuilding HVAC pieces and parts. Um, that's a that's an inappropriate use. And the other thing is when you talk about that and a little bit later talk about open handguns and blow lances. One of the requirements for those lances is an OSHA requirement. And an OSHA requirement says it can't be any more than 30 psi, and the end of that lance actually has to have a stop check on it. So you can't, if you put it up against your hand, it stops. Most of the time, you won't see that in companies and organizations because it's easier to use a piece of copper and just hook it to a hose and away you go. So again, it's very, very inefficient and also can be a safety issue. So many of these are, we talk about sparging, agitating. Um, that can that you may have if you have anything that any kind of a treatment facility for you know for example any kind of if you get into any situation where you have a complex that may do their own own treatment on site um, aspirating it's using the flow of a one gas with another such as a flue gas so you might have some of this in in boilers if you go through and have large flues or going through and trying to trying to get the flue gas up atomizing which is delivering a liquid as an aerosol Again, if you look at this, you might have boilers that have fuel oil as a secondary component and going through and using compressed air to go through and atomize that. That can be done with a high pressure pump and a nozzle. nozzle, nozzle. These other ones are, are just transportation methods that you have on going through, that you see for going through and having transporting of material in a, in a you know, in like mineral processing and or, you know, the, 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 the dilute phase is light transport for things like fiberglass. Vacuum generation, anytime you use a Venturi effect to make a vacuum. Personal cooling, which yes, people actually take compressed air nozzles and put it on themselves to cool themselves down. And you know, it always got me because it's not only not that cool, but it also is an oil mist that's going for the oil system. So not the best in the world neither. Um, diaphragm pumps, those are, those are pumps that are used for, for heavy materials and, and, and sludge type materials. Cabinet cooling for electric, so you may see people going through that have, you know, that may have some HVAC systems that they're, they've got a, a fan that keeps tripping out on a motor, so they put compressed air in there to try to cool it down. Again, same problem you have with, uh, you know, that we talked about, and air motors. So those are mainly, like I said, industrial, but think about when you're talking about retro commissioning. If you start getting to a point where you're going through and looking at com retro commissioning, pneumatic controls and pneumatic actuators and pneumatic valves and damper controls and all of these with doing electric, don't forget to look at the calculation for the cost savings you'll get by not doing it pneumatically. Okay, it's another thing, if you're not putting it in your cost, put it in as part of the cost savings and justification you would have to your project to go through and do that. And the more I'm hearing through this whole conference about a lot of the 4G, 5G and technologies that's happening, if that's going to come along and we're going to have that, it might not be that hard to go through and slap up a thermostat, put it over the internet to control it, and get rid of the pneumatic thermostats you have to control something, and have it directly control whatever that valve is using the technology. So again, some of these things may not be ready now, but be thinking about it when they do come along, that there may be those opportunities, and take advantage of saying that's the savings, and this is, this is what we would go through and get. Okay. So these are just some, these are just some examples that I had, pneumatic mixers to electric motors, and I've, I've, I have seen it where they've used this um, for, for actually going through and using either mixers or going through and agitating for things like, um, for things that you might have for like, um, for like different kinds of um, water treatment systems for cooling towers and things like that where you're mixing the chemicals and everything. You may find it, you may actually run across that kind of a thing. Again, these are just some examples, more industrial, but DC tools for pneumatics, um, paint blowing and, and parts drying in component plants to either use the high efficiency nozzles or use the, the low blower, low, um, low pressure electric blowers. So anywhere you're blowing something off with compressed air. And then of course, cabinet coolers, um, replace those with fans and HV, H, HC units and the vacuum generation can use uh, smart pumps. So this is just some of the things that, that I had done on the conversion. Um, next one that, that I think is always really big and I'm always concerned about is maintenance. So maintenance, 
I'll, often it's penny wise and dollar foolish and at least in the industry I was in, what I found was every time we had the money to do maintenance, we were running production all the time and I couldn't shut down to do maintenance. When we had time to go through and shut down, we didn't have the money to do maintenance. So again, it was, a, it was always a catch-22 that you had and you could never go through and do it. So we want to go through and give you some things on compressed air systems that where do I go through and flip that switch that says it's going to cost me to do this as opposed not going not, not going through and, and uh, doing the maintenance. So the pressure drop across filters, across uh, the refrigerated dryers, filters, etc. Again, that 2 PSI, 1% efficiency, you can go through and calculate it. The other thing it does is it increases temperature, moisture. If you go through and don't clean after coolers and inner coolers uh, on a compressor, uh, no matter what the system, for example, if you have a refrigerated dryer, They've got what's called the 100-100-100 rule. That's what, basically it's designed for 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 100 PSI inlet, and 100 degrees ambient. If you go through and go all, anywhere outside of those parameters, you'll go through and have to derate the dryer. One of the biggest things that happens is when you go through and don't clean an after cooler that's cooling down your air, what does that do? If you take a heat exchanger and you don't clean it, what happens even in HVAC? <laughs> you don't get rid of the heat, and so the, it comes in hotter. So if I take and I put 120 degrees Fahrenheit into that same dryer, because of the density of the air and its ability to hold moisture, it will double the loading on a dryer. So you have to have twice the size of a dryer if you don't go through and get rid of it. Otherwise, you'll have moisture carryover and issues in the plant. And this gets into the, into the quality of the system itself. Um, again, inlet filters for... For inlet filters, it reduces the compressor capacity. So just like, just like your HVAC system, when you go through and you have an inlet filter that gets plugged up, what happens between the pressure differential? It goes up and then what does it do to, the, what does it do to your actual horsepower on the fan? Same thing. In this case, for every four inches of water column, it's 1% efficiency loss. So you can actually go through and use that to, to calculate the cost of going through it. And the last one for production people is production downtime, um, and that's, that's an important part. But I would say for anything, you know, if you have a compressor system that's driving processes or driving your HVAC or controls, if it goes down, what happens? It stops working and you have all kinds of comfort problems that you're going to have and a lot of complaints. Biggest mistake, uh, a maintenance loss is air leaks. Um, Department of Energy would like to go through and have a, a leak, leak rate of 10% being a tight, tight system. Most of the time you'll find 20 to 30% leakage. Air leaks cause um, inefficiency, the leak itself. For a quarter inch air leak at 10 cents a kilowatt hour running all the time, it'll cost you $18,000 a year, okay? So it's a, it's a very expensive, very expensive proposition. Air leaks also go through and do that pressure drop that I talked about. It messes, messes with the pressure and it goes through and causes higher energy costs, increased maintenance. And many times what happens, especially in production, is they go, we're running out of compressed air, buy another compressor. And you know, many times you'll end up with, I bought this compressor to feed production and this compressor to feed leaks. And you're going, well, that was smart. <laughs> Why not just go fix the leaks? And it may be harder than, than that, but but think about it, You're, you've got the same similar situation that you may have in an actual building, especially older buildings with pneumatic lines, tubes, and everything like that. So understand what that leakage rate is. You know, go through a time when, if it's pneumatic controls, go at a time when you know that you're not going to go through and have a lot of, lot of variation and, and temperature differences on the controls that you have for your HVAC system and see what it's using. See when there's nobody in the building, no occupancy, and it's a nice mild day, what are you actually using on your compressed air and what do you have to do to keep that pressure up? And you may find that you've got a lot of leaks in the system itself. And again, back to that, you know, justifying even converting the electric piece. You know, the nice thing about electric controls is they really don't leak, so you don't have to worry about that, right? So you don't have to worry about that system. So again, going through and keeping that as part of it's an important part, okay? Any questions on that piece? So, did you know at $200 a year, 
A leak can, can't be felt or heard. If, it, if you can feel it, it's $800 a leak, but it probably can't be heard. If you're hearing that leak, it's at least $1,400 a year. And that's at 10 cents a kilowatt hour running around the clock. So again, when you go in and actually hear it, you can go through and actually put dollar signs towards it. So, you know, many people say, well, geez, if I can't hear it, how am I gonna fix it? Well, enter maintenance device, ultrasonic tech leak detection. Many of you may use ultrasonics for many different reasons in maintenance and, and going through and looking at motors and bearings and some of the other stuff you can do. But ultrasonic leak detection is a great way to go through and, and look at leaks. So again, the way an ultrasonic leak detector works is anytime you go from, on both of these, you can see one of them is a vacuum leak, one of them is a, a pressure leak. But anytime you go from a high pressure to a low pressure, it passes through that orifice and what does it do? It creates turbulent flow. That turbulent flow has an ultrasonic wave that can be done. It's a, again, it's a high frequency wave that's of short duration, so as soon as it gets farther away from the leak, it drops off. So it makes the ability to go through and put something on either with the handheld ones that have an indicator or the ones that you put, a, you put earphones on to go through and hear the intensity. The closer you get to the leak, the louder the, louder the, the actual noise will be for the ultrasonic leak detector. So it gives you the ability to go through and find them and go through and do that. So implementing an aggressive air leak, uh, identify the leaks and the big thing is fix them. And I always talk about that because I had plants that did a great job of doing, doing leak tags, putting it in, putting it in their PM system. They just never went back and fixed them because they didn't take, weren't able to get the money for the overtime on weekends. So going through and doing it, you want to establish the reduction program on an ongoing basis. You want to go through and um, use the detection to find them. You want to most importantly fix them. The big thing you want to do is you want to always go through and give the savings and results to management. And then you want to go through and make it part of any aware, energy awareness you have. So these are potential areas you're going to go through and see for leak areas. Um, you'll have a lot of those. I mean, some of the, some of the pneumatic stuff is a built, a built in leak. Because how, how does a thermostat, bimetal thermostat work? It reduces the pressure, so you're going to open a valve and it puts it back on. So it's kind of a built in leak anytime you have a pneumatic system that goes through and uses for controls. So just a case study, uh, Woodhaven, we did a lot of leak detection, put together a team, they worked on stamping presses, did header, header pressure reducing, got rid of satellite compressors, removed the dryers. They were able to reduce the uh, amount by 18%, one 800 horsepower compressor was shut down, six 30 horsepower, reduced it by five PSI, and saving um, 7.9 million kilowatt hours and $400,000 a year. And again, the most important thing is to actually go through and fix them, because that, that many times is missed. This one I won't go into, that's more of a thing for, for industry, but we talk about the last 30 feet of the pipe, which is all the hoses and all the pneumatics and everything that's being done, all of the links and everything that's done, that's usually where the biggest problems in a compressed air system are. Heat recovery, this is another one for you to look at if you have that ability, again, understanding what the, the heat recovery is in a system. Um, again, most of that power that we talked about from compressed air goes into heat. And basically what you can go through and do is you can go through during the winter time is to go through and have that, have the air go through it, through the, rather than go outside, it goes into an area for treating, treating the area. And when it goes through and it gets into summertime, it goes through and exhausts it out the, out the actual uh, wall to get rid of it. So um, it's a way of going through and capturing, capturing heat, especially in cold climates. This just gives you some heat of recovery opp opportunities. Big thing is space heating. You can also use it for water heating, makeup air heating. You can use it for boiler water makeup and even drying compressed air uh, with heated compression dryers for oil-free systems. These are just the sources of the different ones again. And again, this is, just the, this is just the different methods that we're talking about and where you can go through for, oil, for air cooled and water cooled compressors. Probably most of the compressors, unless you get into large complex, you're gonna be dealing with are gonna be air cooled um, because it's not until you get into, into higher, you know, a little bit higher um, horsepower that you get into the water cooled systems. 
Total design, real important part here is that, you know, as you know, once you go through and design a system, you locked in the operational costs. So don't forget that when you're going through and doing it. One of the things we fight, and you guys may fight too, is this just gives you the compressed air cost. If you look at the, the total cost of a compressed air, 30,000 for the equipment, 3,000 a year for maintenance, and 26,000 a year in electricity. So within less than a year and what, a couple months, the electricity has already dwarfed the cost of the equipment. Many times what we run into is when they're buying compressors, they've got purchasing doing it, and what do they do? Cheapest one. Cheapest one you can possibly get. So what we try to tell the end users is you gotta go through and look at a total cost and go through and say, look at the incremental difference when you put the efficiency into it, and what is that? And what I found, whether it was compressors, whether it was lighting controls, whether it was um, automation controls, it didn't matter when I was doing, dealing with energy. Most of the time, I could go through and get a year payback on the incremental differences if I went through and did it. So again, system, system design cost. Again, you gotta go through and look at the most effective way of doing it. Um, the right mix of compressors we've already talked about. The end use have to, be, have to be specified for the lowest possible pressure. Pressure drops in the system need to go through and be taken care of and gotten rid of. Uh, again, the incremental cost of looking at it when you're putting in a system is, is small compared to the overall cost and efficiency ongoing, as well as you know most of it's in labor, especially if you talk about a piping distribution system. And then, of course, we talked about heat recovery, making sure you go through and put heat recovery in whenever you can. So kind of the pitfalls um, that you run into with compressed air using full load calculation. So if you take your... your horsepower and you do the KW per CFM, I mean KW that you have and, and uh, from horsepower to KW and take it times the operating hours, it assumes full load. If you do that, you're going to go through and, and get you know, over overestimate the savings. Uh, using average KW for off-peak savings, this is, a, this is not new to you guys because you deal with energy all the time. Um, assuming the artificial demand I mentioned for unregulated sources. Um, Pressure flow controllers, people thought that you didn't need a compressor control system, which is wrong. And then going through and looking at looking at doing the, cap, the low cost solution before going through and doing the capital. So going through and getting rid of those leaks, the inappropriate uses and everything that are, that are required. Okay. And then the final, final one we have there is not using utility rebates. That is a, that's a big one that I, you guys are all, always using, but many people don't stop and take the time to look at what that is to help justify the cost. Or in some cases, they think it's too much of a pain to go through what they have to go through to get it, and they just implement it anyways, okay? So people, they're the key to, to finding, implementing, and sustaining energy. Um, if I told you, you're, let's say you guys are all utilities, and I came up to you to propose this is my demand, demand side management program. I want you to go through and I want you to buy jackets, hats, keychains, pizzas, t-shirts. What would you tell me? Go for it. Go take a hike. <laughs> oh, you'd say go for it. Well, that's good. Everybody else I talked to said, no, that ain't going to save any money. Monroe Stamping Plant, I had an hourly led team. They had red jackets that, so they would stand out. They implemented an aggressive awareness program, not just on compressed air, but in, in, in general, um, especially around leaks. They gave away buttons, keychains, hats, t-shirts for getting the, getting the reporting them and getting the leaks fixed. They went through and the, each quarter they had, their, they had their red coat on it where they go around on weekends and they do an energy audit of the areas. Every area that got the best, ener got the best audit got pizza for lunch. They posted leak boards throughout it. They used the communication monitors that were in all of the, uh, to broadcast messages on energy throughout the, throughout the plant. The result was they went from 17.4 million cubic feet to 9 million cubic feet per day. Their non-production went from 5,400 down to 600, saving over $2,000 a day in electric alone. Okay, so again, the most important part here is it created a culture of awareness and understanding for energy usage and waste, which is a huge thing. So my big thing is, and it's with energy as well, they're the ones that use it, get them involved. Make sure that they're involved, and they're also the ones that know where the problems in the facilities are. No matter whether it's a building 
production, doesn't matter. Go to the maintenance guy and he will be able to tell you what's wrong and what he has problems, or he or she has problems with as you go forward. Again, the key components of a, an awareness program is to go through and target the people, end users with the training, use uh, site-specific examples, go over through and do an overview of the compressed air system, understand the demands like leaks and inappropriate uses. Uh, compressed air is inefficient, so understand that, and then they're the key to using it wisely. Uh, and CAC has actually developed one for, um, for people to be able to use, especially industry, to go through and customize it. So it's an important part. And then the final thought I have, because it's what I've always believed and always preached when I, from when I was the global energy manager at Ford, um, for lasting energy efficiency, make it part of what you do, not additional to what you do. When, I, when somebody asked me, what's it feel like to be Ford's global energy manager? I said, it's kind of like selling ice cubes to Eskimos. With the other 20 things they got to do, I got to go through and convince them to do energy efficiency too. So guess what? What you do is you make it part of what they do. So how do you do that? ISO 50001, ISO 14000, sustainability initiatives, and the blue things are actually things that Ford did. If they got lean manufacturing, continuous improvement, any of their objectives, um, again, Ford had the Ford production system and the energy management operating system. I also got it on the plant manager's scorecards for energy. They had to go through and that was part of the way they, they actually went through and got, you know, went through and got measured. So if you put it in objectives, in, in the U.S., we're really great. It'll get done. Okay, so again, make it part of it, and again, make it part of the cost um, when you're going through and talking about it. And with that, this is just uh, compressed air, you know, some more information, case studies, training, all that good stuff on compressed air with the compressed air challenge. And with that, I'll shut it off. No, I won't. <laughs> Questions? Okay, great. Thank you very much.